Okie dokie. So this is, can the people ever grow up? Comments on Shushan Li. What did the emperor ever say in Tao Journal of Comparative Philosophy? Cool. Short paper. Let's go. Shushan Li's What Did the Emperor Ever Say? The public transcript of Confucian political obligation is a splendid instance of historically grounded political theorizing. Li employs James Scott's public transcript framework in order to excavate a theory of political obligation that applies to common people, moving beyond the focus of most prior analysts on the, theory, uh, on the theoretical obligations of Confucian scholar officials and other elites. I find much to admire and little to di disagree with in Lee's historical analysis and application of Scott's framework to China. Part of my remarks will thus be suggesting a few ways to fill out or enhance his analysis, but not objecting to his core account of the basis and nature of pre-modern Chinese popular or mass political ob obligation. See, I know nothing of this. That's why this is interesting to me. What is your, what is like a um, political obligation, let alone a Chinese po popular mass political obligation? Toward the end of his article, though, Li makes connections to both contemporary empirical attitudes and to contemporary theoretical or normative views, so I'll make some similar connections of my own, asking in what way Li's account of public obligation might be able to make room for the idea that the people, as political children, might one day be able to grow up. What does that mean? How do the people grow up? All right, find out. Let's begin with some backgrounds on legitimacy and political obligation that can be frame that can frame and undergird Lee's account. Legitimacy and political obligation have been perennial issues within broadly Confucian theorizing. A particularly common framework for legitimacy, often put in term put in terms of Zheng Tong, I apologize how I say any non very boring English words or names. A term that goes back to Ban Zhao in the first century CE has three dimensions, heaven, earth, and person. The first dimension took in things like whether the royal family engaged in ritual proper sacrificing. The second paid special attention to whether the dynastic realm occupied the central Chinese plain. As for the person dimension, this typically referred to the virtue of the emperor himself. Each dimension is understood to be necessary, and they are jointly sufficient for the dynasty to enjoy legitimacy. Whom, though, are the addressees of such legitimacy claims? In fact, we can imagine a number of different audiences, from competitors to the throne, to elites wondering whom they should serve, to the common people. In this context, we can see that Lee's focus is on person dimension as addressed to the common people. While this is fully appropriate, one minor quibble I have with Lee's account is that he does not situate it alongside research that has been done on the ways that Confucian theorists address person dimension leg legitimacy claims to elites. I am thinking particularly of Alan T. Wood's book, Limits to Autocracy, from Sung Neo-Confucianism to a Doctrine of Political Rights. In this case, we have explicit theorizing, there is no need to rely on a public transcript analysis, and we somewhat similarly see that absolute obedience is not expected. Lee does note in passing that some such res research has been done, but it seems to me that a more explicit comparison with Wood's findings could, have, could only have enhanced Lee's own argument. In a nutshell, Lee's thesis is that in the text and practice surrounding Yang Zhen Emperor's amplified instructions of the sacred edict, we can discern a three-layer persuasion appealing to private duty, fear, and political obligation. And the key to popular obligation is a conditional theory of paternal, paternalistic gratitude, based on the emperor's caring concern toward his people. I very much like the focus on gratitude, gratitude for caring concern, which implicitly suggests a way of interpreting filial piety as well as gratitude to the ruler. This implied approach to filial piety lines up well with P.J. Ivanhoe's argument that filial piety is not based on a debt to one's parents, for for example, for one's existence, but rather on the sense of gratitude, reverence, and love that children naturally feel when they are nurtured, supported, and cared for by people who do so out of a loving concern for the child's well-being. Filial piety is so relevant because Lee, very convincingly, views the public transcript as articulating an analogy between families and the family writ large that is the state, but one clarification that I would request of Lee is whether he sees the analogy in question as between parent and state, which is what he repeatedly, repeatedly says, 
or between parent and ruler? In other words, is it a personal dyadic relationship or about a relationship to a group or institution? I suspect the answer is the former, such that parent is to child as ruler is to subject, is the right analogy. Possibly relevant here is a 20th century critique owing to Liang Qi uh, Chao and others that traditional theories in China lacked sufficient attention to groups in the first place, thus making it all the less likely that public transcript should be read in terms of the state. Okay, so they're saying, look, they're really, really leaning on the uh, family sort of orientation as the state is to the subjects. So that's interesting. There's no like... um. No, it's the ruler, not the state. It's really going, the, the ruler is personally a thing. So it's a very uh, person-oriented thing. As opposed to like the state, as opposed to the ruler. Okay. As a way of transition to the contemporary implications of Lee's analysis, I can begin by agreeing with his critique of the Asian barometer surveys, head of family question, and of the inferences that many researchers draw from it. The survey question asks respondents to assess whether government leaders are like the head of a big family who should all follow their, deci their decisions. And Lee explains that many prominent researchers conclude that the high degree of agreement with the statement equates to an endorsement of an unconditional obedience and loyalty. Since Lee has shown evidence that obedience to the parent slash rulers was not understood to be unconditional, not only in elite theorizing, but crucially for the present context in broader understandings, then it is likely a mistake to read the contemporary responses as endorsing unconditional loyalty. At the very least, Lee's research gives us a good reason to think that the default interpretation of such answers should be merely conditional loyalty absent further evidence. In those East Asian countries most influenced by Marxism, there might in fact be countervailing evidence. Marxist and Confucian modes of anti-individualism are often conflated with the former's call to a sacrifice for the masses coming to overwrite the latter's model of relational self. In this context, there may be a slide from conditional patern paternalistic gratitude to unconditional loyalty to the people or their self-appointed representatives. Lee's contribution is relevant to understanding contemporary attitudes, but we should not forget how complex the sources of these attitudes are. Okay, so it's not unconditional loyalty we need to like your parents or the state, because it is actually more sophisticated than just they are the person, the people that are in charge. But like it's a gratitude thing, so you have to be gra uh, gra gracious about something. You have to have gratitude for certain things and how it was done. It's not just gr a blind gratitude. So it's uh, that caring gratitude has its uh, particular ways in which it was. And that also relates how you are to uh, deal with your leaders, actually. Okay. So that's a... Uh, how is this model working? So we've got a moral theory that then reflects how we should politically decide things. So the inter the moral interactions of a family and gratitude, and I guess the, the, this is kind of maybe the etiquette stuff also on this side of the uh, Confucianism. They have sort of an etiquette theory. So how do we should we interact with our political leaders has to do with um, this sort of uh, structure of gratitude. I salute you. Our Philumen Association. Thank you for the follow. Our Philumen Association. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry if I screwed up your name. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for the follow. I'm um, trying to think. How does this actually work? Yo, how you doing? Uh, welcome to chat. Welcome to the stream. Uh, yeah, welcome in. This is what I do here is I read stuff a lot of times. I used to play more Minesweeper. But uh, I just read these philosophy papers and try to figure out what the hell is going on, if they have anything to say. So thanks for uh, dropping the follow. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so, and as always, uh, ask questions. If you have any questions, want to know something, let me know. All right, so this is just what I'm trying to figure out. How are we actually interacting with, like, the state or the rulers? And so it's this sort of more sophisticated uh familial sort of interaction based on gratitude but this paternalistic gratitude is does not have to be uh like so unconditional um yeah okay another way to probe the contemporary relevance of lee's findings yeah so we're just reading a paper here i was like i don't know what's going on 
find out. Another way to probe the contemporary relevance of Lee's findings is to see how it sheds light on the well-known debate headlined by Kevin O'Brien and Elizabeth Perry over what to make of discourse of rightful resistance in China. To the extent that Chinese citizens were turning to the language of rights to make claims on the government, did this signal an important shift in Chinese political culture? O'Brien, Lee, and other colleagues argued that it did, whereas Perry countered that workers who demand that as citizens they have a right to eat would seem to be following more in the moral economic footsteps of Mencius and Mao than in the liberal tradition of Locke or Jefferson. At first blush, it would seem that Lee is likely to side with Perry here, how, at least on the interpretive question of how we best understand this discourse. Hey, Valpo, what's, in, what's up? However, it is intriguing that in his article, Lee does not embrace the effort of Tsinghua University theorist Feng Zhaohui to re rehabilitate the three bonds. On the one hand, Lee does agree with Feng's interpretive claim that the bonds did not envision absolute obedience. Nonetheless, Lee writes that he is still ultimately sympathetic with critics of Fang because Confucian political obligation, even when understood correctly, is not applicable to the modern world where political liberty and equality are valuable norms. Okay, so yeah, so if you were working within this sort of family structure, then you're going to have the etiquette and, grat and caring gratitude that you have to show. But that gives you some leeway within the etiquette and caring gratitude. But if then you have like pl uh, separate things where you've got political liberty and equality, that's not going to be the same thing. Uh, see, our uh, association, I'll just call it URF Alumni Association, um, I don't know enough about Chinese history. So I don't know what the May 4th movement is. You'll have to let me know. Um, like, um, sadly, history is like something I'm terrible with. Um, and like, this is just not my area. But like, I like finding out about this stuff. So it's like, I don't know like what this uh, is. You mean Western liberal individualism has been in the culture for well over a century. That's fair. Um, and so I guess that's what the argument is here. Like, why are they picking out certain like theories and histories as opposed to the other ones? So I don't know. Like, I just don't know. But like th these people are, you know, I'm sure they have their reasons for like picking what they think is the actual cause here. Yeah. All right. So he concludes that, I mean, that would be Fang concludes that if Chinese citizens believe in their right to political participation and deny the possibility of a paternalistic and benevolent ruler who can always be public minded and infallible, they should reject any attempt to reinstitutionalize re the three bonds. Lee's stance is thus clear. The Confucian theory of political obligation that he studies here is not normatively attractive today, whatever lingering effects it may have. Okay, so he's saying, yeah, he's going straight to the history here, then, if it's not, uh, it's not normatively attractive today. So that's what the uh, theory is here, that the ancient stuff, um, because it lacks, it is only based on the family sort of obligation, uh, the family analogy. And that means it's not taking on any of the, uh, what you're, I guess, saying is that they're, they're explicitly not doing anything in terms of the modern, uh, liberal, uh, theories. Okay. Author says, I believe it might be valuable to explore whether there are resources within Confucianism itself that might complicate the picture Lee paints here. Fleshing out his understanding of paternalistic gratitude, Lee writes, when N is applied to politics, it, con it connotes that the commoners are depend dependents of the emperor's kindness. As political children, they are disenfranchised because they lack the wisdom to make policy. Implicitly, the key idea here is that commoners, the people or men, cannot become politically or eth ethnic, eh, excuse me, politically or ethically mature. They are children who can never grow up. <laughs> By the way, if you decide you want to take a break from papers, you could just wrap a bit. No pressure. You're free to ask whatever you want. Like you can ask whatever you want. Uh, if I don't want to answer, I don't have to answer. But you're free to ask. And uh, no, nah, that's kind of what I do here. So I just read the papers and see how it goes. But you know, people always uh, are free to ask questions, and sometimes we go off talking about stuff for a while, and that's cool too. I mean, as long as it's TOS. Okay. To begin with, we might contrast with. Shun Zi's idea that the great filial piety consists in following the way and not one's lord, following the proper norm and not one's father. Yeah, so if you're going to just do 
following the way, the Tao, I guess. So the idea that children might grow up and be able to critique their parents is not alien from the Confucian tradition. Now, admittedly, Shunzi may have understood maturation to apply to elites rather than commoners, even though he also clearly saw that commoners could overturn the ship of state. As I noted earlier, Alan Wood has shown that there are similar ideas about following the way rather than one's lord in elite song dynasty political theory. Our question is what rules out the idea of commoners becoming politically mature. Yeah, okay. So they have this sort of like rigid structure, but there are still historical reasons to think that someone could find their own um, non-ruler-based like way of uh, governing themselves because they could follow the way on their own. In contemporary Confucian political philosophy toward progressive Confucianism, I argued that there is a tension between claims about implicitly individualized people in general and claims about commoners or people as a mass, as far back as Meng Zi, and that resolving the tension can move us in the direction of a more egalitarian Confucianism. Whatever exactly we make of this argument, I think we can more generally observe that a key differentiator of modern Confucians is the extent to which they challenge the distinction between elites and the people, or the extent to which they are skeptical about the possibility for the people's ethical political maturity. Consider the spectrum of Confucian theorizing. From the various forms of meritocracy, which resists or constrains significant roles for the popular participation, to Yutanjin's Confucian leadership democracy, which envisions de democratic elections for top leaders but still limits the degrees and types of popular participation, to still more democratic or participatory forms of progressive Confucianism, such as envisioned by Sor Hun Tan or myself, or to those who abandon any political dimension of Confucianism at all, only looking to it as a source of personal values. That was a long sentence. In light of all this, we can ask what Lee's research might be able to suggest about the possibilities for modern Confucianism. Is there any nuancing the men are immature forever, so like the people are immature forever idea in the sources Lee has examined? Are there any tensions hiding in the sources that a modern Confucian might exploit, or for that matter, which historical resistors to Confucian autocracy did exploit? Or does it appear to be a, sense, a seamless fabric that cannot be stretched in the ways some of us are trying to do without completely ripping? I realize that the historical record is limited. Perhaps it cannot usefully speak to the possibility of the people as children who might eventually be able to grow up. But only if we interrogate the public transcript with questions like this can we fully exhaust the ways in which Lee's research shapes op options for contemporary, Confucian, or otherwise political theories in China or more broadly in East Asia. Okay, so this was like this was real short. It was just a comment on something else. But like this is a like obviously a huge topic <laughs> um, on how like contemporary Confucian thought actually might make a difference for political uh, thinking in all of Asia. Um, and like as they were saying, there are ways in the tradition that you can do things that isn't just like uh, in the structure of the family. Or in the like rulership cast to the people, um, following the way and not not one's lord, following the proper norm and not one's father from Shengzi, um, so that the idea that children might grow up and be able to critique their parents is not alien from the Conf Confucian tradition. So how do you make sense of this then? Um, I don't know. Like I'm not supposed to know, I guess. But like. In the West, of course, we've got this like massive, massive uh, individualism uh, thing that we always do, for better or worse. And in like the Confucian tradition, you have this like alternate history where everything is sort of within this sort of familial structure, as the author was arguing, that the child to the parent is the same as the subject to the ruler. And so you just have to follow, as you are the child, you have to follow your parent. Um... But yeah, the great filial piety consists in following the way. So this is saying on this, all, the Shunzi is saying, or Shun, Shunzi, yeah, Shunzi, is saying that fil, you are only actually to have filial piety to the way and not your parents. And so there's something outside of uh, the family or political structure that exists separate from it. And so they're saying, look, um, Lee does not talk enough about this. And so is there anything else we can do? Hey, Tropical Geek, what's up? 
you interrupt this program to say, hi, happy new year. Hi, happy new year. Thank you, Tropical Geek. And there is a new philosophy stream you'll like. I left it posted in our Discord right now. Cool. I will go take a look after stream. Uh, RF Alumni Association. This reminds me of the idea that obeying the commandment, honor your father and mother, sometimes means disobeying them when they command you to commit sin, and thus you honor them by obeying God and truly behaving honorably. Yeah, I think that's exactly kind of along the lines with what the author uh wanted to say up here that there does seem to be a part of the tradition that allows for diso uh, disobeying uh, the ruling person but only in a very 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 limited sense um, it's like yes when you are they command you to like commit like obvious sin then you are obligated not to do it this all always uh, what's the uh, biblical story where the father is told to murder his son and he goes and he does it, and he's only stopped at the last second by, like, God or an angel or whatever. And so it's like the son just, like, does it or whatever. He just, like, lies down and is going to be killed by his dad. But, yeah, Abraham. Yeah, story of Abraham and Isaac. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can see I get streamer brain very quickly doing this. So I can't remember things, but I kind of get it right sometimes. Um, yeah. I hope you're doing tropical. I hope you're well, Tropical Geek. It's good to see you. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by anyway. Yeah, so <laughs> RF Alumni Association. I'm trying to figure out what the RF Alumni Association is, but <laughs> it's a good name. <laughs> All good, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But this is the question. When do you actually get to break the rules? Are you jumping? Yeah, go. Feel free. Feel free. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, yes, for a mod for... God, I can't even do uh, things. How, uh, what is that? HOI 4... I'm terrible. <sighs> Halo 4 or something. Whatever. Okay, yeah. So when do you get to break the rules, I guess, is really... Um, is really the question here. If you are in this structure, as the uh, author is arguing, when do you get to break the rules? And I think that's a good point from uh, RF. That there are positions that you do get to do it in, you know, all the traditions where there's certain things that you're allowed to do outside of the uh, political or family structure given circumstances. And what is that? Like, when do you get to break your political obligations or become, as they say, grown up? When do you get to do it? And, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So this is the thing. This is what, in the end, they didn't have a great conclusion. The question is, when do you get to break it? And do you get to, like, ha when does the uh, authority stop being the legitimate authority? That's another way of putting it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, but at least you can see in this tradition, there is a way that they can say. I mean, of course, traditionally hard to say what it is to follow the way in, a, you know, that that tradition. Um, and, of course, like, breaking, you know, God's law, like, when there's, like, a sin, how do you actually know what that counts as in, like, uh, you know, the West? Not so, not always clear. Like, when do you uh, call someone out? I don't know. Do you guys have anything else to say? I'm not, like, uh, I don't have anything more because I just don't know of history. But I like learning this stuff. And so, I, you know, I read it, get a little, like, stretch my brain out in this other direction. Like, what is it to have this sort of history of a family structure of, like, caring, uh, what was the term? Duh. Like, caring gratitude, or, yeah, caring gratitude is how you're supposed to react to, uh, both your political leaders and your parents. <laughs> 